Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Federalist Society virtual event. My name is Emily Manning, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups with the Federalist Society. Today, we're excited to host a fireside chat with former FTC Chairs Timothy J. Muris and Maureen K. Olhausen. Our moder moderator today is Svetlana Gans, partner at Gibson Dunn and former Chief of Staff at the Federal Trade Commission. If you'd like to learn more about today's speakers, their full bios can be viewed on our website, fedsoc.org. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to you, the audience, for questions. If you have a question, please enter into the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window, and we will do our best to answer as many as we can. Finally, I'll note that as always, all expressions of opinion today are those of our guest speakers, not the Federal Society. And with that, thank you for joining us today, and Svetlana, the floor is yours. Uh, great. Thank you so much, Emily, and uh, also Nate, for all your help with today's program. As um, Emily said, my name is Svetlana Gans. I'm a partner at Gibson Dunn and also the co-chair of the Federalist Society Corporation Securities and Antitrust Executive Committee. I am humbled today to moderate this fireside chat uh, with two FTC former FTC chairs, uh, Tim Muris and Maureen Olhausen. Uh, we're going to discuss the state of the Federal Trade Commission today. Uh, first, I'll provide brief introductions, and then we'll dive in uh, with some uh, questions. And then, as Emily said, we'll take questions uh, from the audience. Um, Tim Uris is a senior counsel at Sidley. He served as the chairman at the FTC from 2001 to 2004, where he oversaw the creation of the uh, National Do Not Call Registry, increased antitrust scrutiny of IP issues, and challenged fraudulent and deceptive advertising and health claims to protect U.S. consumers. Prior to being elevated to chairman, Tim was the director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection and the director of the Bureau of Competition. He is the only person to, to head both of the agency's enforcement bureaus. Maureen is a partner at Baker Botts, where she chairs the firm's antitrust practice group. She served as chairman and commissioner of the FTC, as well as the director of the Office of Policy Planning. Maureen is the only commissioner to have received the Robert Potofsky Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of her knowledge and contributions to the commission. Welcome to you both, and thank you for being here. Thanks thank for having so, me. Great. So to kick off this panel, um, I wanted to turn to Maureen first and then to Tim um, with this with this first question. Um, the FTC and other Biden administration pronouncements reveal that they are making sharp departures from the decades long approach that they had inherited. It will soon be three years since the president took office. Can you please comment on the progress they have made to date? Uh, well, thank, thanks, Svetlana. Delighted to be here with you and, and with Tim and to address one of my favorite topics, the Federal, the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, so the, the current uh, leadership, you know, they have very much, you know, uh, signaled their desire to make a sharp change. Uh, and they've undertaken, I think, a, a substantial number of actions to attempt to do so. So lots of policy statement uh, have come out. Um, uh, you know, rulemakings, unfair deceptive acts or practices rulemakings, uh, most notably also an unfair method of competition rulemaking to uh, pro essentially prohibit uh, nationally um, non-compete agreements, uh, changes, uh, proposed changes to the merger guidelines, to the HSR Act. Um, so they've really launched a lot uh, of initiatives, but they so far really haven't landed any of them. Uh, some of them are, are quite time consuming to, to do so. Um, and uh, the merger challenges that they've brought under sort of their new aggressive theories have not been successful thus far. So the question is, you know, where have they really um, so far made a difference is they've really focused on using the process to try to get um, changes to behavior in, in the market. So we see, um, uh, you know, continue, you know, don't allow early terminations, um, you know, uh, a lot more uncertainty in um, merger review, uh, uh, you know, not uh, not wanting settlements, th things like that. So, so far, you know, they've been active, they have a lot on their to-do list, uh, and, um, but for lasting policy changes, not really something that has been, you know, taken up in the courts or implemented 
in Congress uh, to, to make those kinds of changes. Tim, what are your thoughts? Well, again, I, I want to echo uh, thanking you uh, and and Maureen and the Federalist Society. Uh, and I also want to make clear that uh, my views are mine and not not any not my two employers, the state of Virginia, and uh, I also uh, uh, the, the the Sidley Law Firm. Uh, to to echo Maureen, I I attended UCLA uh, long ago during John Wooden's uh, remarkable uh, ten basketball championships in twelve years, and he famously said, "Do not mistake activity for achievement." Uh, and he could have been talking about today's uh, FTC. Let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, and that's the FTC that the Biden team inherited. GCR publishes an annual star ranking of about 40 competition agencies. In this century, the FTC was the only, the only five-star agency every year pre-Biden. Now, there's nothing wrong with demanding change, but you would have thought that you before you demand change, you need a consensus that the agency was failing. Yet President Biden announced that this widely acclaimed agency uh, was instead a, quote, experiment failed. Now, the Biden change is to return to policies long abandoned. Take the thoroughly repudiated robinson Patman Act. Like some bad Halloween joke, Robinson Patman is arising from the grave. More broadly, another example, there was an early surprising change in the FTC's strategic planning. Uh, the commission had long stated something that seemed obvious and innocuous, and that was it would enforce its laws, quote, without unduly burdening legitimate business activity. What happened? That phrase was deleted. That what, 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 which seems self-evident that that you wouldn't want to burden legitimate businesses was deleted. No explanation was given, but the message of of hostility to business, especially big business, was obvious. The new leaders call themselves neo Brandesians, and an anecdote about about the Brandes neo Brandesians in the original Brandeis is especially telling for today. In 1936, President Roosevelt. Uh, in, to launch his re-election campaign, echoed the original Brandeis, and he attacked what he called the economic royalists, who were causing, quote, economic slavery. Four and a half years later, the world and his language were much different. He said, not economic royalist anymore, but, quote, the arsenal of democracy. So these bad people had become the saviors of the world. Had the original critics had their way, would the arsenal of democracy even existed to have such a central role in winning World War II? So ask yourself, in today's dangerous world, if the neo-Brandesians had controlled policy in those 40 years that they condemned, would the technology leaders they decry have been allowed to succeed? Now, it's that industrial strength that the United States needs in today's uh, suddenly, uh, what seems suddenly, but it's not, if you've been paying attention, very stormy international waters. Um, thank you. So one, um, you know, one response to, 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 to this critique um, that has been voiced is that this new approach um, reflects the the true law as Congress had in, um, anticipated when they drafted the statutes at issue. Section 5 of the FTC Act, for example, um, provides FTC broad authority to um, ascertain unfair methods of competition and unfair and deceptive trade practices. So, so Tim, what, what is your response to that claim that um, the current administration um, um, holds true to the original intent of uh, of the FTC. Well, this is a you know this is a favorite theme of the of the Biden FTC, it, it, especially in mergers and in the as Maureen mentioned the the new unfair methods of competition focus. But the law to which they're faithful is usually ancient, and it's well before the 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 so called failed forty years. 
Now, to the contrary, the truth is that the experiment that failed is that old law, which was long repudiated by the Supreme Court and the lower courts. Now, I'm I'm sure we're going to discuss the substance of, of, of things like mergers. But if you look at at, at merger law and, and other other ancient law, it's relevant on this on this fidelity issue. Uh, that age, in that ancient law, consumers were so irrelevant that companies did not dare claim they were acting to lower prices because if they did so, they would increase their market share and that would harm their competitors. And that, and that was a risk of, be, of being illegal. Into the 1970s, the government almost always won cases, even if the courts had to create markets that existed only on paper. Now, in this world, the courts used business progress to condemn business practices. In the 60s, with mergers specifically, the Supreme Court three times found a merger in an unconcentrated market illegal with a single digit combined market share, including the often cited brown shoe. Now, these are what Chair Khan has called controlling precedents. If she really meant that, that would be the cases that are controlling. But the law has changed. The Supreme Court clearly uh, has changed. It began the change in mergers in 1974. There's been decision after decision based upon the consumer welfare standard that, that they claimed that they abandoned. And an example of the change, a stunning example, which is too often ignored, is the FTC's case record in the 1970s. In cases filed in the latter part of the 1970s, the FTC, relying on the so-called controlling law of the 60s, won 13 of 35. In mergers, it was eight of 22. Now that's better than the Biden administration's record, but that's still terrible. And that's a far cry from the government always wins that was in the 60s. Uh, but don't try to say uh, that that those controlling precedents uh, uh, are have anything to do with today's law. That was a fantasy today. It was a fantasy even decades ago. And if you don't believe that, just ask the FTC circa 1980. Uh, so let me to you know b build on what what Tim said, and particularly in the area. I know we're going to talk more about merger law, but the this issue of going back to these you know fifty year old Supreme Court precedents and saying, well, that is the true law um, for mergers. And what is uh, really not been explored is why hasn't there been much Supreme Court case law on mergers. Is in the intervening 50 years, it's because the the way mergers get reviewed changed. We had the Hart Scott Rodino Act passed in 1976, where there was pre-merger notification. So if there was an issue with a merger, um, it can get challenged before it was consummated. Previously, we had the Antitrust Expediting Act. Uh, things were, you know, quickly passed up to, to the Supreme Court. So the idea that somehow the Supreme Court came to the you know ultimate realization of what merger law should be you know in in uh, you know Brown shoe um, I, I think overlooks the fact that because the review process has changed and and changed for a good reason right which was the idea that we wanted to preserve the ability of the agencies to prevent uh, any competitive merger to you know not have the eggs be scrambled. Um, so the really important case law on mergers through the circ is at the circuit level, who all interpret those Supreme Court cases, right? So it, those, so I think that is a little bit of a, a dodge, right? To say like, oh, we're just going back to the old to the old case law and the Supreme Court case law controls, uh, and you see in the merger guidelines a failure to acknowledge or wrestle with. Um, the that circuit that circuit case law, uh, which has been super, you know, very very important in putting a gloss, I think, on some of these uh, these cases and um, and making sure they're not being sort of over over read. Uh, one other area about like fidelity with the law is on the unfair methods of competition policy statement, 
The FTC tried uh, uh, four times previously in modern era to try to push forward with aggressive um, UM, freestanding UMC, meaning it's not a Sherman or Clayton Act violation, um, and lost in the courts, uh, three times in the appellate court and once in district court. And uh, those cases have guidance about what UMC should be and, um, you know, showing an impact on competition, having to assess, you know, take into account business justifications. And the UMC policy statement simply elides over that, doesn't really talk about it. One other thing about that is it goes back to the old, old case law that is, uh, I mean, to the uh, um, uh, legislative history and kind of cherry picks. Um, without really exploring the fact that the, the, while it was maybe meant at the time or clearly meant at the time to go beyond uh, where the Sherman Act was, the Sherman Act then had been con, um, interpreted in a much more constrained way, right? So as the Sherman Act boundaries got expanded, what happened to the boundaries of unfair methods of competition? Does that mean that it's always, you know, five miles beyond the boundaries of the Sherman Act, right? And I think that the, the, the UMC policy statement doesn't doesn't deal with that with that issue. So th those are two areas, I think, that um, fidelity with the law, you have to look at sort of what the law is today uh, across the board, not just sort of picking and, and choosing a few favorable terms or, or statements that you like. Okay, so before we leave the merger topic, I'm not sure if either of you had any any additional comments on mergers and and maybe a little bit on merger process. Um, Marina, you mentioned earlier that a lot of what they're doing is is process reform, and I know that you were uh, did a lot of process reform initiatives when you were chair uh, to streamline process to make it um, easier for both the FTC and parties to produce relevant information to get investigations done in more streamlined fashion while still preserving the FTC's ability to get what it needed to do its job. Um, but uh, Maury, maybe we'll start with you in terms of the merger review process. Anything you'd like to say on the HSR revisions or pr proposed revisions to the merger guidelines? Yeah, so there's been a lot of attention paid to the changes, to the proposed changes to the, to the merger guidelines. Um, all this you know, focus on like just one thing that stands out to me is, you know, this proclamation that um, antitrust law prefers organic growth over acquisition. Well, it prefers it not having a substantial impact on competition, right? It, it should be agnostic whether <laughs> if it's not having an impact, whether it is through organic or, or not. But putting, putting that aside, um, I think it's really important not to lose sight of the fact that one of the ways that uh, Lena Khan has talked about this, Jonathan Cantor have talked about this, is deterrence. They keep sort of touting how they've deterred mergers, and that's been their success, right? Maybe they haven't been able to stop them in courts, but they've stopped them from, you know, even uh, moving forward at all being proposed. Um, and when you look at the proposed changes to the HSR filing form, uh, which are incredibly, incredibly extensive, will be very, very difficult to comply with, very extensive. Of mergers that are reviewed, like when the HSR Act was passed, Congress struck a balance, right? Because it, Congress doesn't, has never said that mergers are bad or that mergers, you know, you know, should be overall deterred across the board. They tried to strike a balance for the agencies to have an ability to review uh, and not burden legitimate business, as Tim, as Tim mentioned. Um, so the new um, merger um, HSR changes are uh, having like very wide like data collection uh, for a hundred percent of mergers that are notified, and we know that only about five percent of mergers ever really get. M most mergers are fine; um, they don't raise any concerns whatsoever. Um, uh, they will be burdened. 95% of, of those mergers who never get a, another look will have these, these burdens in place. For the 5% that maybe gets a deeper look and the two percent, well, roughly two or two and a half percent that ever get that ever get challenged. And I really think this is part of this kind of approach to say, well, if we can't get Congress or the courts to change, you know, the standard for what we think is an illegal merger, we're just going to kind of put a burden on mergers 
overall. And I think, you know, keeping an eye on how that's really going to operate through the HS proposed HSR changes is really important. Uh, Tim? Sure. A, cu a couple of points on the on the law. I, I wrote a long, a long tome that would, if nothing else, might help with your insomnia. It's on AEI.org. Uh, there's a sh it was published in June. It's it's it's, it's about Neil Brandisi and antitrust trust and subtitled repeating history's mistakes. And there's a, a, a earlier editorial in the uh, in the Wall Street Journal on on the process. Uh, the hostility to business is is especially relevant here. The the first uh, Biden director of the Bureau of Competition was asked at the ABA spring meeting uh, to identify a single positive attribute of mergers, and she couldn't. Uh, uh, the uh, the Neil Brandishians should read Maureen's excellent uh, paper on the, uh, that summarizes the many uh, the many. Papers that 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 show the positive attributes. Uh, instead, what's going on here, and Maureen has mentioned this now, is 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 the idea of of raising the cost of mergers through process. It's what Scott Barche, who's the chair of uh, of the Paul Weiss corporate department, said is an interorum campaign to create uncertainty and delay that results in many fewer mergers. Now, this is the opposite of good government, and it increases the hostility that's already great uh, toward Washington. As Maureen indicated, the HSR system uh, is ripe for abuse. I'm going to throw out some statistics, which are uh, on a different, ba a little bit different baseline than uh, than Maureen's, but 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 quite similar. In the 28 years ending in 2021, either agency requested clearance to investigate. That doesn't mean they did anything serious, but they they thought about it in 13.7% of the transactions. They issued a second request in only about 3% and a challenge in only about 2%. Now, there are multiple ways to increase delay, and this administration is experimenting with seemingly all of them from abandoning early termination to expanding the scope of second requests to warning letters to increasing administrative litigation to, to avoiding settlements except perhaps beyond the last minute like in the in the Amgen uh, uh Horizon case uh and now and this is what Marine is talking about it's proposed to increase requirements on all mergers even that overwhelming majority in which it has no interest and this is a game changer. And, a, and and to add to Maureen's point, this cannot pass muster under a faithful reading of the Paperwork Production Act, which requires that information is, quote, necessary for the proper performance of the function of the agency and its practical utility. Now, the FTC, the, the government's change in, in HSR has to be reviewed in OMB. Uh, where I was present decades ago at the uh, 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 at the creation of the office in OMB, which will review this. Uh, and if they're faithful, and one hopes they are, uh, duty uh, the F the the proposed change is in trouble. If not, the new requirements, if they're adopted, are a formal mechanism to allow the government to increase delay with the accompanying uncertainty about the timing and ultimate disposition of the mergers. Like those informal mechanisms I just ticked off a minute ago, these changes are going to be a tax on mergers. And that, you know, when you increase the cost, you decrease the supply, and that's apparently what they desire. And it's imposed without regard to the likely competitive effects, and it ignores the potential benefits that are laid out in Maureen's paper through lower prices and more innovative products. And again, it is the antithesis of, of, of what good government should do. So, Tim, I guess one response that the FTC majority might have in terms of the justifications for the changes were reflected in their statement stating that the HSR reforms are meant to fill key gaps that FTC staff most routinely encounters, such as inadequate information about deal rationale or the details of how a particular investment vehicle is structured. They also pointed to the fact that several international merger regimes already call for this information. So what would what would your response be to that, 
to that justification? Well, again, the 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 FTC Hart Scott Rodino was if if you look at what the 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 people who wrote the act uh, at what they said, instead of applying to something like sixty thousand filings in the time period I talked about, they said it was going to apply to something like into under ten thousand. So it's wildly over inclusive, uh, and the the international systems that you're talking about, I believe, are not are not anywhere near as over-inclusive as ours. And as Maureen was talking about, there are scores of filings that are that are over-inclusive that, that nobody cares about. And even if even if the current people are twice as aggressive or three times as aggressive, they're still massively over-inclusive. And that is uh, uh, that cannot pass muster under the cost benefit test of the Paperwork Reduction Act. OK, um, so we have just a few moments left. I wanted to ask a question, one question and a question I received from the audience um, with Tim and then Maureen um, in terms of being bold in term, uh, you know, with respect to FTC initiatives. Tim, you are bold with the do not call registry. And Maureen, you are bold uh, with numerous initiatives, including the Economic Liberty Initiative, among others. Um, so is there a problem with being bold? Um, you certainly had great initiatives in your tenure. Um, or, you know, why is it a bad thing to try to implement new policies and even to change course radically? Tim, I'll, I'll turn to you and then Maureen. Well, well look, the... 2020 was like 1968 and 1980 in that a new administration came in and said we need to change course but the difference is there's no wide there was no widespread consensus of failure uh as i mentioned the ftc was the only five star agency uh instead what happened is is the new chair came in replaced the acting chair, who was a Democrat, replaced her people entirely with with Commissioner Chopra's staff. And Commissioner Chopra had strong views that 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 were open and notorious. He believed in the deep state. He and Donald Trump were simpatico, uh, believing that there was something wrong with the FTC career staff. And what what they did quite quickly was a series of insults. They first ordered all of public appearances canceled, and they ordered them to to lie about why they were being canceled. They said they were canceled because of pressing matters at the FTC. Two weeks later, they had a, a public meeting that was unprecedented. They adopted new matters, important new commission steps with no participation in this public meeting from the career staff. I've been involved almost 50 years with the FTC and never seen anything like that. Shortly after that, with Chair Khan at his side, the president of the United States announced to the world that what this five-star agency had been doing for 40 years was a failure. Uh, the FTC staff reacted. They voted with their feet, and they also voted in a, in, in a survey uh, where they had previously said the FTC uh, leadership was the best among those many surveyed to the worst. Uh, and uh, that's not a way to run uh, a railroad. If you want to make change, you need you need to take organizational and leadership steps that were done uh, uh, following the 68 and 80 election, and they haven't done that. Maureen, what do you think? I mean, did it, weren't the most recent results more positive than the earlier results? What, what would you say to that in terms of the viewpoint surveys? So let me address the viewpoint survey briefly, but then turn back to the change, to the change point. Um, yes, so they went up slightly. Uh, and that is on a different cohort of people, right? So you had, you know, many, many, a big exodus from the FTC of very knowledgeable career staff. Um, and Chair Khan has brought in, you know, people who, you know, assume presumably see the world the way that she does. Um, and um still did not receive overall that positive <laughs> a rating. So um, so yes, maybe it's gone up a little bit. The unhappy, a lot of unhappy people have left and a few you know, supporters have been brought in. 
Um, but but on the change point, um, look, it, it's perfectly fine to try to use the authority Congress has given you in a way that, you know, it is bold, right? That fits what, you know, the powers that uh, are allowed to an independent agency in, in, in the U.S. But we have, you know, um, a system of limited government. Uh, we have, you know, three branches of government, um, and you, it, it is not appropriate to simply say we couldn't get the changes we wanted through Congress. We couldn't get them through the courts. So we are just simply going to impose them as essentially, you know, acting in a legislative capacity. And may I add one that decided that it could preempt all contrary state law. Right. That's what it did. That's what it said the FTC could do in the um, uh, non-compete ruling. Right. So I think that's a little surprising. Did Congress in Section 5 of the FTC Act specifically say the FTC could preempt all state laws? Uh, uh, that struck me as a surprise. Um, when you look at, like, for example, in COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which does preempt state laws, Congress said it. Right. So I think, you, you know, the... It, there's nothing wrong with acting boldly within the parameters of our three-part government with limited powers where Congress uh, is the grantor of those powers and where the courts are the arbiters of what those powers really should be or, or have been granted, I should say. All right, so I did get a few questions and we could just run through them quickly um, and then we could uh, call it a day. So uh, Maureen, I guess I'll turn to you on this one. Um, uh, there are some who appear uh, to embrace the neo-Brandeisian antitrust view, uh, both who are politically on the right uh, because of their dislike for large corporations and politically on the left um, who are uh, willing to abandon the consumer welfare standard as they believe um, it has led to the corporations having too much power, uh, particularly cultural power. Um, what concerns do you have with conservatives embracing the weaponization of antitrust enforcement to target what some of them consider political enemies? So I would say, be careful what you wish for, for you may get it. Because if then antitrust becomes simply a tool to uh, disfavor, harm, slow down, you know, kind of ha hamstring your people that don't agree with you politically. You may not like the outcome when someone else is pulling <laughs> pulling the, the, the strings, right? When someone else is deciding that. But even more, in, you know, and that's concerning in the U.S., but even more importantly is what is that signal around the world? We've spent many, many years uh, across administrations in a bipartisan way talking about how antitrust should be focused on consumers, that it's not industrial policy, that it's not meant to be a way to, you know, punish, um, you know, competitors who, you know, are competing hard with, uh, you know, uh, national champions. Um, but we've really lost, I think, that high ground now, right, by saying, no, it can be this sort of multifactorial, you know, decision of like, well, maybe it's supposed to favor, you know, well, people we agree with politically, or maybe it's supposed to favor, um, you know, other constituencies other, other than consumers. Uh, we really may not like how that's wielded against not just a few, you know, tech companies that people might have some beefs with. But once that starts being wielded against American industry overall, and I, I'm, I really have serious concerns about the, I mean, the current leadership will move on, uh, new people will come in, but those, you know, statements will have continuing um, ramifications in the future. Tim, how about you? Oh, I, I agree. I agree with not weaponizing antitrust, but the the five star FTC, which which I hope uh, could still be retrieved uh, in the next administration, uh, th there's a role for it in the in the non enforcement area. Uh, let me give you and when the FTC was trusted, let me give you an example of what happened following Columbine. The president asked the FTC to study the impact of violence 
uh, in the media on youth. And the FTC w- wasn't looking to do enforcement. It was looking to find facts. And then the FTC uh, did a very good study and it, you know, it, it recommended some, some disclosure. What bothers conservatives a lot about uh, uh, about these big companies is they think that they discriminate uh, in in speech, uh, and that's something the FTC could have studied. The problem now is, you know, a study from this current FTC. There's a lot of people who just who just wouldn't believe it the way that the that the F, that the FTC, which was, you know, had bipartisan support, was was believed before. But the FTC has a long history of doing uh, 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 important reports, and I hope it's not too late for the FTC to retain that role. Um, One other question we received is uh, something concerning the challenges to FTC structure and authority in the wake of the Axon decision. Um, what are your thoughts? Do these challenges pose real risks? And what might the courts do in response to those challenges? Well, we're we're in a very interesting period because the FTC is acting, you know, uh, quite bold. You said boldly. That's a good, that's a good term. Quite boldly. Um, and asserting, you know, these very broad powers at a time when the courts are moving in this direction to really have a a very skeptical view of the administrative state, right? The FTC lost nine to zero in the AMG case, right? Where it had long claimed to have redress authority. You know, that's not just a right-wing view, right? (laughs) When you lose nine zero in the Supreme Court, then you have the Axon case. So they're under this like, you know, very intense scrutiny um, at a time when uh, the agency is, is like really trying to expand its 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 authority and its powers. So it does seem like um, you know there's going to be some collision. Uh, they're, they're already happening, I think, uh, and um, I, I think it's it's not going it's not going away. It's definitely not going away. I, I I certainly agree that it's not going away. And and, and you know, look, AMG is a good example. Uh, I had long argued uh, and, and helped create the idea that the FTC had a very narrow authority to get redress. When the FTC and the Obama administration said it could get redress from anybody, I, with Howard Beals, wrote an article in 2013, said, you're jeopardizing the whole program. Unfortunately, our prediction turned out to be true. Uh, uh, I think uh, humility uh, among regulators, which which Maureen uh, so uh, eloquently talked about when she was in government, uh, uh, is the order of the day. Uh, and humility in this administration do not belong in the same sentence. Okay. And, and let me just uh, sorry. Oh, let okay. me just add one thing onto that, which is. I'm, and I know Tim is a big supporter of all the great things the FTC can do. Like, I don't, I don't say this with the glee, like, oh, let's get, you know, let's have the FTC run itself off of a cliff. I think that would be a real shame and a real loss for American consumers and American and American business. Tim mentioned a lot of the great stuff the FTC has done. Um, so, you know, my, you certainly offer these, I offer these remarks uh, in the spirit of wanting, uh, you know, uh, a successful, uh, effective FTC to to continue. Okay, uh, last question, and then um, we will wrap up. Um, both Jonathan Cantor and Lena Khan often note in interviews that if you ask five people what the consumer welfare standard is, you'll get six answers. Um, but have they proposed an alternative to the consumer welfare standard or at least one that can be applied in a way that doesn't devolve in what uh, former Commissioner Wilson has said, I know it when I see it standard. Tim, I'll start with you and then Maureen, you can wrap things up. Well, look, uh, again, we, you know, we're dealing with people who are interested in an activity and clicks and not and not real achievement, as I think that that quote indicates. And the merger guidelines are the are the perfect example. The former directors of the bureaus of economics and the head of head economist at the Justice Department have just sent a letter 
Uh, and the letter makes the very uh, uh, important point that by turning the merger guidelines into a legal advocacy document, they are threatening to remove its 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 force as a as a document that both provided guidance uh, and and got judicial credibility. Uh, uh, there was again this long the the 40 years couldn't have existed as something to be criticized unless it had coherence. Uh, and the coherence couldn't have been as incoherent as they claim. Uh, the, the, they can't have it both ways. Uh, uh, and the reality is, of course, that the consumer welfare standard uh, as a, a, could result in disagreement in individual cases. Uh, but it was involved people who, in retrospect, I think we can all see it now, we're, we're mostly arguing between the 40-yard lines, to use a football analogy, and, and we now see what real disagreement looks like. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, 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 it's radical, it's, it's unsettling, uh, and it's anti-consumer. Uh, Maureen? Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't think it's that hard. I mean, who who were they asking? The the man on the street. I mean, you know, um, yes, uh, antitrust is um, you know a rather challenging uh, doctrine. It's, it can be you know sort of uh, economically you know because it's driven by economics. But at, but at heart, what the consumer welfare standard is is does this behavior, does this thing that we're looking at increase output or decrease output? Does it increase prices or does it decrease prices? Does it increase choice for consumers or decrease choice for consumers? Does it improve quality or uh, or, or or not improve quality? And we need to look at that dynamically over time. And is it doing something in a way that is foreclosing a competitor from succeeding on the merits? On the merits, right? And so, one of the challenges that I think that we have with whatever standard they want to put in its place is whose interest is being served? Like, is it the consumer or is it a competitor who says, well, yeah, you're going to have a, a cheaper product um, and I, that's going to make it harder for me to compete, ergo it's, it's anti-competitive. Or, you know, I want access uh, to your, you know, um, facilities, the essential facilities doctrine. Because uh, that'll make it easier for me to, to compete, but we're we're going to totally ignore whether anyone is going to invest in creating those facilities to begin with. If then they have to share them, once they're successful, um, they have to share them with competitors on whatever terms the government decides to set is the fair the fair terms. So so you know personally, I, I, it's not something. Yes, sometimes that you know there may be factually you know complex or economic you know. Um, modeling that needs to be done. But as a concept, I don't think the consumer welfare standard is that difficult. I think it's actually rather straightforward and clarifying versus having some sort of like eight part balancing test based on, uh, you know, uh, this sort of hodgepodge of factors that they seem to, you know, labor, competitors, you know, environmental, I don't know what else might, might go into it. Alrighty. Well, I think we're at time and I don't see any additional questions. So I wanted to thank you both uh, for being here for your views. Thank again, Emily and Nate of the Federalist Society for hosting us in the audience. Um, and Emily, do you want to take it away from here? Yes. On behalf of the Federalist Society, thank you all for joining us for this great discussion today. And thank you also to our audience for joining us. We greatly appreciate your participation. Check out our website, fedsoc.org, or follow us on all major social media platforms at FedSoc to stay up to date with uh, announcements and upcoming webinars. Thank you once more for tuning in, and we are adjourned.